Welcome everyone to Network 2020's discussion of change on the horizon, the impact of new diplomatic ties in the Middle East. Uh, we are delighted today to have a top panel uh, with us to discuss these very interesting questions um, at a time of transition in the US, no less. Um, as background, uh, my name is Courtney Doggart. I'm the president of Network 2020. Network 2020 is a New York-based nonprofit organization. We are really focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the foreign policy world. So we try to bring experts from the foreign policy worlds to our constituents in New York and around the world now um, who are interested in learning more and really going a few levels deeper into what's happening in different aspects of foreign policy. Um, and then we're also really trying to look for some innovative solutions as well. And so we, we run a number of programs in addition to this virtual briefing series and you can learn more on our website. So today I am so pleased that we are joined by three top experts to dig into this question. We have Ambassador Martin Indyk, who is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He has years of experience working in the Middle East, uh, including in the government as two-time ambassador to Israel and senior director for the Near East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, as well as assistant secretary uh, for Near Eastern Affairs at the Department of State. He has also worked at and served on boards and advisory councils of notable think tanks, including Brookings, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Lowy Institute, the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel, and the Israel Democracy Institute and American Media Abroad. He has two books under his belt, and if not more, and I think a third coming out soon on uh, Kissinger and the Middle East. Um, and again, I'm truncating these bios so we have more time for conversation. So um, next up we have Dr. Sanam Vakil. She is the Deputy Director of the Middle East and North Africa Program at Chatham House in London. She is also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins SAIS in Italy at the School of Advanced International Studies. She's also had taught there in DC previously. Um, she has worked a lot on some of the geopolitical um, issues in the Middle East with a focus on Iran and, and Gulf geopolitics. And last but not least, we have Dr. Hussein Ibish, who is a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. He is a frequent commentator on Middle Eastern affairs, um, including a weekly column for Bloomberg and The National. He, uh, but that is just just his regular columns, and he is a, you can see him uh, elsewhere in the media quite frequently. He is an off recommended voice on foreign policy, um, and one of the top recommended Twitter users uh, for foreign policy for for several years. Um, and but. He also works on anti-Arab bias in the United States as well, so he has a lot of work on that issue too. He was previously senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine and the executive director of the Hala Salam Maksud Foundation for Arab American Leadership. Again, very truncated bios. Uh, please read more about them and follow them uh, in their various spaces because they, they're wonderful voices on Middle Eastern affairs. Um, so with that, um, I am going to kick off um, our conversation with just a teeny little bit of background. So in August of 2020, the US, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates signed the Abraham Accords with the Emirates becoming the first Arab country since Jordan in the 90s to normalize relations with Israel. And that agreement laid the foundation for a signature diplomatic achievement for the Trump administration. Since then, within the wider region, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan have all followed suit. Um, and there are a lot of implications for the region, uh, particularly for the Palestinians, but also Iran and even Turkey. Um, so there's, there's really a lot to dig into. And you know, the question of whether or not more countries will follow suit, especially as the US enters a, trans, a leadership transition period, since this was a big push by the Trump administration. So I'd like to start just by digging into the current situation. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, we've seen four Arab countries normalize relations with Israel since 2020. Um, while it may seem like there's a wave of changing sentiments across the Middle East, it is worth noting that within each deal, um, each agreement is a little bit unique. And so we've had some good conversations among the panelists earlier to talk about, you know, what, what are some of the, the, the motivating factors and drivers um, behind the accords and within 
each country's particular agreement. And so, Ambassador Indic, I'd like to turn to you first, just to, if you wouldn't mind giving your um, your take on what what's motivating um, the, the, this process. Uh, thank you, Courtney, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, address uh, Network 2020 today. Uh, I think we have to look at uh, longer term factors, dynamics uh, that were driving this process, as well as the, the immediate things that, that produce this, uh, these breakthroughs. Uh, and also, I think we need to kind of separate the Gulf states of uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain from uh, the Sudan and Morocco that are kind of particular in their own right. But the prime mover in this was the United Arab Emirates. And the prime motivator, well, there were actually two, I think, for its leader, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. Uh, the first was uh, fear of Iran, uh, which had led over a number of years to uh, a good deal of security cooperation between Israel and the UAE uh, under the table, uh, but increasingly uh, in, in more open ways as uh, Sheikh Mohammed felt it was necessary to find a way to kind of normalize the relationship. Uh, so he was already moving in this, in this direction out of a sense of common interest with Israel uh, in terms of what they saw as a common threat from Iran. But I think that, that the critical short-term factor was uh, the Trump administration's decision to launch a so-called peace initiative which uh, had as its key element uh, Israel's unilateral annexation, blessed by President Trump, of uh, the West Bank, including the Jordan Valley, uh, which was seen as a real problem for King, Hussein, King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, of neighboring Jordan. Uh, and uh, King Abdullah has essentially been Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed's ward for some time. And he was deeply concerned that this could destabilize Jordan, the annexation that is, and that that would create a problem in terms of another threat that he's preoccupied with, which is the Muslim Brotherhood and the potential for the Muslim Brotherhood to take over in Jordan, uh, connecting with Turkey and uh, Hamas in Gaza and so on. He has very big concern about that also in Libya. And so the combination of these factors led to the idea that uh, to provide himself with cover for normalization, which he wanted to do anyway, he could uh, get an agreement to take annexation off the table, protect King Abdullah, and get the bonus of some F-35 uh, aircraft, which he wanted for his air force uh, on top of that. So it was a rather uh, creative way of, of uh, serving both his long-term and short-term ends. Bahrain can be seen as a proxy for Saudi Arabia, uh, sharing basically the same interests. Although I will note that as my understanding that Mohammed bin Zayed did not consult with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia before this, wanting to get the advantage of being the first mover. Uh, Bahrain essentially went along and interestingly did not condition its move on anything essentially because it was covering for Saudi Arabia and removing the pressure from Saudi Arabia to do the same. Thank you. Already <laughs> it's looking like a very complicated chessboard. Um, Hussein, I'd like to turn to you now, um, yeah. if you wouldn't mind expanding on that. Uh, no, I, I think that those are all excellent points. Uh, I, would, I would just note that the Abraham Accord is, is a two-page document that is very nonspecific and very aspirational. It's, it's um, very full of soaring humanistic rhetoric. It's Abu Dhabi-tastic. It was certainly drafted in the UAE. They're very good at that kind of stuff. And... Uh, you know, it doesn't amount to much, but it's a good marketing device to put every normalization process into the same basket, really for, for uh, Trump more than anything else. The, each agreement is separate, right? So that, so that uh, actually Bahrain and the UAE signed the, 
the two pager on the same day. And then the UAE signed their specific agreement with Israel. And then a few weeks later, Bahrain signed a significantly different deal with Israel. And then Sudan signed a different deal with Israel and has just now signed the two pager. And Morocco has barely signed anything and has only agreed to reopen liaison offices. And they want to know about uh, whether the uh, Biden administration's recognition of their sovereignty in Western Sahara is transferable to a democratic administration. Will Biden maintain that? If not, I don't think they're going to go forward. If it is, they will go forward because it's a very big get for them. And it's a very heavy price for the United States. I, mean, I wouldn't pay it, frankly, but, but um, we'll see. I think the main things, the two main things to, I would add uh, to what Ambassador Indyk said, uh, other than those little sort of uh, dots and, and crosses, are number one, each country therefore has its own agenda, right, going into this. And it each is negotiating a separate agreement um, trilater trilaterally with themselves, the United States and Israel. And each one has their own basic demand. Uh, the, the country that went first, which is most enthusiastic, as Ambassador Indyk said, is, is the UAE. Uh, as he said, they're very worried about Iran. He added, completely correctly, the, the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood and Turkish element, because they view, as does Israel, as does Sudan, as does Egypt, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood Sunni uh, Islamist Alliance as increasingly a tool of Turkish foreign policy coordinated from Ankara in a manner that's increasingly analogous to the way that Iran uh, operates its network of Shiite proxies, right? Uh, you know, uh, Sudan wanted to be off the terrorism list and get aid, which they got. Morocco had Western Sahara as its ask, and Bahrain was really mainly interested uh, in uh, shoring up the anti-Iranian coalition. Iran has claimed all of Bahrain as part of its territory, especially under the Shah. But there have been some officials of the Iranian Republic who have repeated that. They, they feel that the, the regime in Bahrain feels under a suspended death sentence from not the Islamic Republic, but from Iran to court, right? So they, anything, uh, any country that's doing military heavy lifting against Iran becomes a good partner for them. Uh, the UAE also was interested in a partnership with Israel on high tech and cyber security, electronic warfare, surveillance, all that stuff, which has commercial applications as well. The, the other thing I would add uh, is that all of this is taking place in the context of the emergence of a genuinely multipolar world, the falling away of the United States, the rise of other players internationally, globally, and in the Middle East, Russia, China, etc., and the need, therefore, for, for countries that have traditionally been reliant on the United States have emphasized the pro-American um, coalition, the American umbrella, to diversify strategically, to develop their own options, regional coalitions, new partnerships, domestic industries, uh, other capabilities, without abandoning the United States, but also without expecting the Americans to react the way they did in 1991. Uh, by expelling Iraq from Kuwait. Now, the Americans may or may not help you if you get into a crisis. And I think for not just for the Arab countries, but for Israel, this is a reflection of that reality. Right, great, thank you. Um, we, you know, we've heard a lot of mention of some of the other countries in the region, including Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Iran. Uh, Sanam, we were going to turn to you a little bit later about Iran, but is there, would you like to add to that now based on um, you know what, what what you're hearing from looking at Iran right now because they seem to be a bit of the elephant in the room. Sure, thank you so much, Courtney. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, there's a lot to say on this, and I'm I'll get to Iran in one second. I just wanted to add um, my view on the Abraham Accords, um, echoing much of what Ambassador Indik and Hussein also said, but. Um, also to just play up the sense in the region um, of anxiety about the role of the US going forward. That's something that is often missed or underestimated in Washington, but 
when you're in the region, um, it really resonates loud and clear. Um, there seems to have been over the past decade, dating back to the Obama administration, but also through the Trump administration, and that's sort of the great irony, despite sort of reaffirming partnerships with America's traditional allies, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Israel, that a deep anxiety about the role and commitment um, of the United States um, to the region remains and lingers. And so I see these anxieties as also motivating and driving particularly UAE and Israel's um, trilateral um, agreement with the United States, um, hinging themselves to the United States and making them more relevant um, in Washington as regional interlocutors. And perhaps um, as we see the UAE and Israel collaborate more openly on regional security issues, um, I think it will be um, interesting to watch this space, map and monitor um, how these two um, important regional states with the UAE being very ambitious and have a country that's taken quite a large uh, regional um, ap approach of engagement, activism, if you will, um, over the past few years, um, how they will try to influence um, uh, and, and perhaps um, uh, step in um, uh, to manage some of these regional conflicts in the Middle East. And I think it's in this space that the context um, of Iran becomes important. And I think it can be equally applied, as Jose mentioned, to Turkey, but also to their shared uh, security threat perceptions from non-state actors. I mean, technically, um, although they both have different um, different policies and tactics towards Iran, Turkey, and non-state actors, they share a thematic thread of being threatened by um, these three um, states or non-state actors. So um, from the Iranian perspective, obviously, um, you know, it was no surprise. Uh, this relationship um, was one that had been operational since the 1990s. Um, the relationship, of course, has, has grown a much more collaborative and, and much more open, um, particularly under the Trump administration. Um, I think the concerns are not in the document um, or are not in the uh, sort of uh, commercial ties um, that are being celebrated um, by both uh, the UAE and Israel, for example, but rather um, in the um, perhaps quiet backdoor um, discussions on defense and security matters. How, um, you know, what sort of future role is Israel going to take in Gulf security matters? You know, these, there are more questions than answers, but recognizing that there might be more overt um, strategic security military cooperation between these two countries could, you know, further alienate Iran. And I also see going forward as the Biden administration um, plans its JCPOA reentry, we're seeing a very coordinated message coming from Abu Dhabi um, and from Israel um, that is the same. They don't want to be um, in the next room or uh, collab, you know, collaborating or communicating with Washington on a JCPOA reentry. They want to be in the room. They want to be interlocutors representing their interests, preventing a return to the 2015 status quo ante, and they want to make sure that their the mistakes of the past are not repeated. All right, terrific. Thank, thank you very much for for, for jumping in there and, and some parts about Iran uh, earlier on. Turning a little bit to, to Saudi Arabia now, that it seems like they, they would really be quite a, a big get if, if, if that were to happen. What would it take for the kingdom to normalize relations and what would be the implications of that happening? Um, Ambassador Indyk, why don't we turn to you first for that? Well, thank you. I think that, uh, as I said before, the, uh, the factors uh, pushing Saudi Arabia towards normalization are very similar to uh, the ones we've been discussing uh, for the UAE. Uh, but the Saudis have traditionally played a, uh, a more reserved role when it comes to dealing with Israel. Plenty of relationships, security relationships under the table, but very reserved uh, in, in terms of overt relations. And um, they've much preferred to be the caboose on the peace train. Uh, rather than play any leading role. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the role that they see for themselves as the, the king custodian of the holy mosques of Mecca and Medina, the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, and they have been more insistent on 
uh, a resolution of the Palestinian problem, the establishment of a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, uh, being the basic position that they have held for a long time and that the king appears to uh, still uh, care about. It's not clear that the crown prince, who is the de facto ruler, cares about it, but, but uh, the king still uh, holds to that kind of traditional position. So to answer your question directly, I think they're going to need something more on the Palestinian issue. Uh, the uh, Emiratis used annexation or taking annexation off the table. Uh, the Saudis are going to want something more. I've heard the Crown Prince himself say some time ago that there needed to be progress towards a resolution of the uh, Palestinian issue. Uh, and progress, of course, is an elastic word. Uh, so I think it will be uh, up to the Biden administration to explore what it is that the Saudis would want. And here you have a very interesting uh, potential because Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, is in extremely bad odor in Washington, not just with Democrats and with the Biden administration, and with President Biden himself, but with Republicans on the Hill as well. That's in part because of uh, Saudi Arabia's role in the war in Yemen, which is the greatest humanitarian crisis that the world is facing at the moment. Um, and Saudi Arabia is seen as responsible for that, Mohammed bin Salman particularly, and for MBS, as we call him, MBS's role in the uh, murder of Adnan Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist. Uh, and so this kind of combination uh, has created some real problems for uh, the Crown Prince uh, with the incoming Biden administration and President Biden himself. And normalization with Israel could well prove to be the kind of get out of jail free card that he can play to uh, get out of this problem, which could manifest itself, the problem could manifest itself in an arms embargo on Saudi Arabia uh, if it doesn't end its involvement in the war in Yemen. So it's facing some real challenges in Washington. If he normalizes with Israel, Israel could certainly help him with that, with their influence <laughs> in Washington. Uh, but I think that, that uh, he's going to need something on the Palestinian front. And so the question is, what is it that, that the Biden administration would seek in this regard uh, that would help to facilitate some progress uh, towards a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that might then give uh, the Saudis the cover uh, to normalize with Israel. Thank you. Hussein or Sanam, would, would you like to add to that? Uh, only that it was Jamal and not Adnan Khashoggi. Excuse Other me. than that, it was perfect. I don't have anything, I, I don't think there's anything to add. Um, all right, Th thank you. Um, it's just a, a lot of what's what we've talked about has, as, as we've heard uh, the names of other countries come up, there, there are obviously a lot of implications for, for the wider region um, and including among them the Palestinians, Iran, as we've talked about a little bit already in Turkey. Um, what are some of the implications for these other actors and how are they adapting to these circumstances? And I, I'd like to start with you, Hussein, just to hear a little bit about the Palestinians and anything else you'd like to add on that. Front. Well, this this is a disaster for the Palestinians uh, in the short run. It's also to uh, an extent that I think they haven't fully appreciated yet a self-inflicted disaster because for the past eight, nine years or so, if when, and let me personalize it, when I have asked senior Palestinians, what's your national strategy, you would get one of two answers. Either they would say the Arab Peace Initiative, which is the, the idea from 2002, the Saudi idea that uh, Israel would uh, basically agree to a two-state solution with the Palestinians. And then when that's concluded, the Arab world and then subsequently the Islamic world would, would normalize with Israel. It, it linked occupation and normalization with uh, ending the occupation first, right? And and this was on the table as an Arab consensus for a long time, and it it atrophied. And now with these uh, normalization processes, it, it it doesn't really exist anymore because the whole logic of it was to have the Arab world serve as a package deal 
to incentivize Israel to come to terms. And that certainly is gone, right? So uh, the other, so either they would say, the Palestinian leaders that, well, the API is our strategy, or they would describe the API without referring to it directly. Either way, they were uh, really kind of putting their national strategy in the hands of other people because it could be, and then in fact was, redefined in a way that made it politically useless, diplomatically useless for Palestinians because it no longer serves as a package incentive or even any kind of incentive, frankly, for, for Israel under the current circumstances. Saudi Arabia might, as Ambassador Indyk was saying, kind of play that role in its own way, at least to get some kind of progress, but Palestinians really are left without a national strategy. And one of the reasons for that is that they don't have a national leadership. President Mahmoud Abbas sees himself as a national leader and describes him, and he probably thinks he's a national leader, but he doesn't calculate like a national leader. He calculates like the mayor of Ramallah. And that's because the Oslo Agreement made him the mayor of Ramallah, and that's what he is. And so that's reflected in his calculations. And so he has resisted, say, using Egyptian proposals to get back into Gaza, uh, believing it was filled with risks for him, and it was, but national leaders take, take risks, right? And that any kind of proactive national strategy, uh, either for political dominance or for achieving liberation from occupation requires risk taking, it requires boldness, and he doesn't have that. As for Hamas, uh, they're split in two. Either they're, you know, local people who think like the mayors of Gaza, or they're transnational people who are plugged in with Turkey, or a few of them plugged in with Iran. And again, they're not thinking like Palestinian national leaders. So there's this, there's this crisis, not just of unity, but a lack of genuine bona fide national leaders. And the leaderships that exist have incentives to act either in a subnational or transnational capacities that is really crippled the Palestinian movement. So lack of lack of leadership and lack of strategy. Yeah. Um, in, in, a, in a rapidly changing hand of cards. <laughs> so they, they missed an opportunity, it sounds like. Yeah, um, because it would have taken political boldness to, to deal with any mm -hmm. of these things properly. And that's missing. Yeah. Sanam, we you talked a little bit about Iran earlier. What kind of reaction are you hearing from within Iran right now regarding all of these moves? Sure. Um, well, as you know, it's been like Anya's horribilis for Iran in 2020. Um, you know, things started terribly with the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the downing of the Ukrainian um, airliner a few days later. Um, there was just a lot of whiplash uh, back and forth um, through uh, rounds and more rounds still ongoing today of um, designations from the Trump administration um, hoping uh, to uh, constrain Iran's uh, regional relationships, um, its uh, train and equip programs, its distribution of lethal aid around the region, or even bring back Iran to the negotiating table. Um, COVID, of course, has added to that. Um, there have been uh, significant um, shifts within Iran's domestic um, uh, climate. And, and I know many people discount the domestic uh, politics of the Islamic Republic or, or say that they don't matter. But um, as someone who's followed Iranian politics um, for many years, they do matter because um, uh, elections uh, produce uh, various leaders, leaders who can um, build the debate and, and fill cabinet positions. Um, and, uh, and sort of shape the discourse and, and, and the guidance given to the Supreme Leader. Um, doesn't mean that that discourse is going to change or transform the Islamic Republic, but shaping that discourse and engaging in negotiations does matter. So we saw Iran's um, political system shift um, towards conservatives after Iran's um, parliamentary election. Iran is gonna hold uh, presidential elections in June of 2021. There is a high degree of expectation that um, the presidency um, will also uh, be taken by a, a conservative candidate um, in December of, I mean, I'm skipping over it. I mean, it's just been crisis after crisis, but there was the assassination of Iran's nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, believed uh, to be um, killed by the Israelis. Um, there was uh, explosions in, in its nuclear facilities. And, and through this process, um, the Islamic Republic has, um, 
been through six or seven uh, um, uh, rounds of, of breaches within the JCPOA to increase leverage and push back against uh, maximum pressure, um, uh, all while waiting for uh, the November elections um, to be resolved. And um, so, you know, as they, the Abraham Accords came out, um, Iran didn't publicly react too much. Um, uh, it tried to put on a brave face, uh, not see this as strategically uh, damaging or uh, not um, really playing up the fact that this could be a regional realignment or a strategic um, shift that could impact Iran. And instead, Iran took on its traditional role um, of uh, as a country that likes to uh, present itself as the defender of the downtrodden. And in this case, um, you know, who are they defending? It's the right of the Palestinians um, and the axis of resistance and standing up to the role of the US and Israel in the region. Um, so Iran took that line forward and it will continue to take that line forward. Um, uh, probably pursuing what it has always done in the region, looking for sort of tactical, coordinated, opportunistic responses to assert itself um, in the region um, uh, through these asymmetric relationships it has built. Um, one of those relationships has been with Qatar that uh, uh, grew uh, marginally stronger through the blockade that was recently, um, cosmetically at least, um, uh, and officially on paper, resolved. Um, and has a very pragmatic relationship with the Turkish state um, as well. And I imagine that if there is more coordination and pushback against uh, Ankara and Tehran, um, that relationship could probably be more um, cooperative um, in a security framework as well. But Iran, um, I don't think, um, sees the Abraham Accords yet as, as a huge problem for it. And instead, it's really got its eye on the Biden administration coming in, um, Biden's um, planned return to the JCPOA. Um, and it sees that as the first step to what it knows is going to be a longer process. And that process is um, going to see um, regional discussions brought to the table uh, with um, regional actors uh, like the UAE and Saudi Arabia if the Biden administration is successful. And probably here the UAE can be the interlocutor or the back channel with Israel, um, which which also could be interesting. But Iran has very, you know, tactical and pragmatic relationships also with the UAE. So Iran is always looking to leverage um, domestic scenarios around the region. Um, if you remember in 2019, the UAE quietly de-escalated with Iran um, yeah. during the summer of instability and attacks on Saudi oil facilities. So um, it, it sees itself as a nimble regional player. So it's important to look at this, the space of the region. Unfortunately, Iran is not a productive regional actor or player, and that's why it's so deeply hated in the region. But um, how Iran can manage all of these opportunities or what it perceives to be opportunities will be important for it uh, going forward. Can I can I add one thing really quickly? I, uh -huh, I think please. the the Qatar the end of the Qatar boycott is more than cosmetic because uh, mm -hmm. Qatar Airways will now have access to Saudi overflight routes and uh, that was the main practical impact of the boycott. What they had to do was pay around hundred million dollars a year and mm -hmm. rely on Iran's forbearance to get access, except these really weird long roundabout routes. So they'll be. First of all, taking a good deal of money away from Iran at a time when Iran can't afford yeah. losing regular sources of foreign exchange in dollar form. And secondly, uh, Qatar will be free now to, to go back to a, a somewhat less conciliatory line. They have to maintain good relations with Iran for you know, various reasons, but not as good as they have been. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if I were an Iranian, I would not have celebrated you know, uh, during on the 5th of, of January. Thank you. Yeah, th th thank you for adding that. I think that, that's an important point. Um, one other country that has come up quite a bit, and, and we will get to the Q&A box shortly. I just want to get another question or two in. Um, one, one other regional actor that's come up quite a bit is Turkey. And this is also on your, to your comment, Hussein, about the increased importance of regionalism. Um, Turkey, I spent a year there, gosh, it's, it's been so long, 2005, 2006, and interviewing university students around the country. And a lot of what I heard was all about the 
role of Turkey in the in the prospect for Turkey to really be a regional player, um, and that you know that's a generation that now is 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 in power. And so you know I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, Ambassador Index, since you brought this up, um, you know, in particularly Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood. Where where do you see Turkey's role in the region headed, and how is this affecting um, some of their calculus? Well, certainly. Um... Uh, President Erdogan has uh, ambitions to uh, be a, a regional player, or even dominate the region uh, if he could. Uh, but uh, it's a stretch to imagine that he can somehow restore the grandeur of the Ottoman Empire, uh, given Turkey's uh, circumstances. And first of all, some serious economic challenges uh, that he faces at home. He does have the ability to project militarily, which he's done in helping Qatar uh, after the uh, siege imposed by Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE. Uh, he has uh, intervened in, in Libya. Uh, essentially, what you see here happening is a, an attempt to fill the vacuum that's left by American retrenchment from the region. Uh, and that was, I think, you know, Sanam referred to that earlier as a way that it's impacting the calculations of all of the players. Um, and the, the sense that Turkey is trying to fill that vacuum is creating a kind of equal and opposite reaction on the part of the Emiratis, the Israelis, who, who both have very uh, difficult relationships with, with uh, Erdogan in particular. But Erdogan kind of can see the way that, that the normalization process between the Sunni Arab states and Israel is affecting the overall balance in this great game. And so rather than be isolated, he himself is starting to warm up or trying to warm up the relationship with Israel. And there's another motivation behind that, which is there's an intense competition going on in the Eastern Mediterranean over the question of, of gas uh, and gas pipelines. Um, the Israelis have discovered a large field uh, between Israel and, and Cyprus. The Greeks have an interest there. They're talking about a pipeline uh, to Greece that would go to Europe, that would compete with Turkey. And the Egyptians are also coming into the game uh, there as well. So there's a whole new dynamic in the Eastern Mediterranean where the Turks have some some real concerns. And so a better relationship with Israel would kind of help to thwart the, uh, the challenge that it's now facing. So the Turks are really kind of uh, trying to maneuver in circumstances in which they could find themselves as at least as much uh, a, uh, a victim of the new Sunni Israel alliance as the Iranians. Also the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean oil uh, confrontation is what is precisely one of the main factors that leads Turkey into uh, into uh, Western Libya, into trying to preserve the GNA government in in Tripoli and especially in the port of Misrata. And it's it's the hub of the claim that they make for this large chunk of the Mediterranean they're claiming to dominate. So it's very important. Um, I, I would simply observe that the, there is a move to um, open diplomacy also between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. And even recently, that is to say within the past 24 hours uh, between the UAE and Turkey, and there's conciliatory noises there as well. So I think all players are both strengthening their um, potential defensive postures militarily and strategically, but they're also, I think, increasingly turning to diplomacy. Um, and I think if, if uh, countries get a chance, they'll use that in the coming year rather than go back to armed confrontation. That was, it was very scary what happened last year for a lot of players. Okay, th thank you. Um, it, it, we're gonna, it looks like we lost Sanam, but hopefully she'll come back. Um, but I'm sure Ambassador Indik and Hussein, I'm sure you can, you can <laughs> handle this. Um, I'm going to turn to the Q&A box now and weave in my last question to you all as well, which is looking at the transition of the administration in the US and what impact that will have. 
and I'm going to do that by taking a question from Frank uh, Finver, who asks, why would the Biden administration want to even think about a peace process between Israelis and Palestinians, given the lack of Palestinian leadership and animosity between the American team and Netanyahu, um, not to mention other priorities? So um, I will, uh, Ambassador Indic, do you want to jump on that one first? <laughs> Um, but I'm sure Hussein has uh, uh, more to say. Uh, but I would just say uh, that, first of all, uh, the question is, is correct. The Biden administration does have other more important uh, priorities. Uh, the pandemic, uh, China, a, a rise in China, uh, being the preeminent ones together with climate change. And uh, Vice President Biden, when he was Vice President, was. Uh, a participant in all of the um, discussions that uh, we had when I was working for John Kerry as the special envoy for the last round of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations that took place, which is more than four years ago now. Uh, they, and I think he saw there what was very clear to all of us involved in it, which was uh, the parties were not only far apart, but the, the effort to negotiate and their differences led them to actually um, broaden their differences. They were further apart at the end of the negotiations than they were at the beginning. Uh, and you put that, combine that with what Hussein was saying about the lack of leadership on, on the uh, Palestinian side and a right-wing leader in Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, who really is not interested in meeting uh, the minimum requirements of, of a Palestinian solution. Uh, much prefers the, the uh, Trump plan, which gave everything uh, to the Israelis. Uh, so I think that, that uh, when President Biden looks at the horizon and the chances for breakthrough Israeli-Palestinian peace, he's, he's not likely to see it as a priority. And I therefore would be surprised if he appoints an envoy uh, to deal with this, unless he just wants to put it aside and have the envoy kind of deal with it without any real commitment. I think really now the challenge is because there's bound to be a, a succession process in, in on the Palestinian side, because Israel is going to new elections on March the 23rd, their fourth, they may even have to have a fifth before anything resolves itself. Uh, there's time and time to, to try something a little different, which is to focus on trying to improve the situation on the ground uh, for the Palestinians in a way that can help to rebuild confidence of the two sides and the intentions of the other. And perhaps down the road, there will be greater opportunity to move again to try to resolve the conflict as opposed to try to create a momentum towards resolving it, because I think the, the real challenge facing Biden today. Yeah. I, I think that's all exactly correct. I would add only uh, one that the, this conflict has a nasty way of reasserting its importance uh, from time to time. It can drift off into the background and then all of a sudden it becomes very politically and symbolically potent. It's a, it's a big destabilizing variable. And until it's resolved, it'll continue to be that. And I think wishing it goes away won't make it so. The The second thing is that the, the immediate task confronting Biden is damage control from what the Trump administration has done to U.S. relations with the Palestinians and the U.S. position towards a two-state solution. So Biden needs to make it clear that the Abraham Accords have superseded the peace to prosperity annexation plan, that Israel cannot come to the United States and the Palestinians and say, right, we're beginning with this instead of the agreed signed 1993 Declaration of Principles as a basis for negotiations. That's not going to work. And uh, he can, you know, rebuild diplomatic and other relations with the Palestinians and take it from there. And I, I agree with Ambassador Indic. At the moment, there's no, there's nothing to work with at the high diplomatic levels, but there's lots you can do on the ground to make things better and prevent either side from taking dramatic actions that worsen the strategic situation while you, you know, repair U.S. policy, which needs an urgent repair. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, and, and welcome back, Sanam. Um, the, the the question was talking about you know prospects for for peace between um, Israelis and Palestinians under the Biden administration, but it also tangentially rolls into uh, both my question about what would happen under a Biden administration, and also there is another question from uh, Abdul Matan who is asking about the policy of pivot towards Asia, which Ambassador Indik also mentioned that it would be lower on the priority list, you know, what would U.S. policy priorities be for the Middle East? And um, and would you want to chime in on that, you know, particularly when it comes to to Iran? Or um, if you prefer to wait, we can, we can have you back once the election's over. <laughs> well, I mean, I think one of the uh, very clear or uh, indications um, that we have to date, you know, with the inauguration uh, just 10 days away is that the Biden administration intends to engage with Iran on the JCPOA. Um, I think that's going to be um, one of their signature um, uh, strategies for the region. Um, but as part of that, um, tangentially, um, they, um, I think, are going to wade into the larger challenges of regional security. Um, the fact um, is that uh, the Biden administration um, is, I think, going to try and uh, dial down uh, the Yemen war in a very um, direct way, as already uh, has been indicated by Hussein. Um, and so how the Biden administration manages uh, a JCPOA reentry while engaging um, with its Gulf partners on, on Yemen, I think, is going to be very important and delicate and um, can sort of set the groundwork for uh, the wider uh, regional piece that I alluded to earlier, um, the one where, you know, regional actors are really concerned. Um, of course, they're primarily concerned about Iran's nuclear activities, Israel above all, but um, for, for most states in, in the Middle East, it's Iran's uh, support for um, proxy groups and militias and its um, ballistic missile program and its um, proliferation of, um, of lethal aid that is a, a principal problem. So um, how those issues are taken on board to prevent um, a repeat of 2015 um, is, is really going to be the critical piece. Uh, compliance for compliance, as the Biden administration has stated, I think can um, relatively quickly be addressed. Uh, uh, the question is, is uh, sanctions, um, are sanctions going to be used as leverage to pressure the Iranians to, to provide more concessions? Is, is, it, is this a negotiation going to be time sensitive to take into account Iran's um, own June elections? Um, and then how are they going to bring everybody else on board uh, to have those regional discussions? I think Israel and the UAE expect that um, Iran will be brought into these multilateral discussions with the JCPOA or with the E3 and the US, and Iran is going to be <coughs> told to give up X number of uh, missiles and um, try and uh, roll back its influence for a number of proxy groups in the region. And I think that's a bit um, ambitious. Um, ultimately, the Iranians are going to demand concessions, <coughs> excuse me, from regional countries as well. So preparing those dossiers and files is required for everybody um, uh, if that regional piece is actually going to be resolved. Okay, so, so, so certainly. About, mm -hmm. Go oh, on. Sorry, no, I was going to say a quick, quick point about pivoting to Asia. You, you can pivot to Asia as much as you like, but Asia, East Asia and South Asia are entirely dependent on the energy supplies from the Persian Gulf. So you are stuck in the first, even if you've pivoted to Asia, you've brought the Gulf with you. Uh, I mean, let, you know, it's just kind of a fantasy. This place is important. That's a good, uh, a good sort of rule of thumb, I guess, to, to go by or something to keep in mind. So th th thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Martin Amdor who asks, uh, doesn't giving, uh, uh, asking about some, some of the arms agreements, but doesn't giving these countries F-15s endanger Israel? Um, what's your take on that? I'm sorry? F-35. F-35, thank you, yes, yes. <laughs> I have it. Um, so, uh, no, it doesn't endanger Israel. Uh, first of all, uh, the F-35s in uh, the UAE are out of the range of Israel, can't reach Israel. Uh, they'd have to refuel, and that would be a vulnerability. Secondly, um, while the Abraham Accords are called, or referred to as peace accords, they're not actually peace accords because the UAE and Israel has, have never been in conflict. And uh, 
there's no reason to believe um, that uh, they could get into conflict. Um, perhaps if there were an overthrow of the, of the regime there, uh, sometime in the future, you could see something. But bear in mind, there's, there's you know, a fundamental reason that they haven't been in conflict, which is geography. They are far distant uh, from Israel and vice versa. So I, I don't think that's a, a real concern. Whereas uh, the United States does have an interest in building the capacity of its partners in the region um, to deal with their security uh, environment uh, on their own with American support, but uh, being less dependent on the United States. Because while Hussein is right about the fact that we, the United States still has important interests in the Middle East, the idea that the United States, after its experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, two longest wars in America's history, a uh, huge investment of blood and treasure. Uh, and the American people see um, no gain uh, for American interests out of that. The reluctance to get involved militarily in the region is very high now and will be for some time. And I think that's a fundamental difference mm -hmm. uh, between the America of a decade ago and the America of, of today. And the pivot to Asia is where we have to focus our security capabilities. So building up the capabilities of countries like Israel and the UAE um, makes sense as long as we have reliable partners. Whereas in contrast, building up the capability of Saudi Arabia, when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia has proved himself to be highly unreliable in the way that he deploys force against his own people and against the people of Yemen. Uh, you know, there, there's a real question mark about arms supplies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Congress, both Republicans and Democrats are asking about. But in the case of, of the Emiratis, I think there's a feeling that this makes sense uh, for their security and for our security, and it's not a threat to Israel. Oh, plus, the Israelis didn't object. <laughs> Good point. Yes, th thank you. Um, one question we have from an anonymous attendee is um, wondering whether or not the decision made by the governments in UAE and Bahrain does that does that trickle down to the people? So are they on? Are they how, how are they reacting to their respective leadership's decisions to normalize relations? So there's much more political cohesion in the UAE than there is in Bahrain. However. I mean, there are differences. There are attitudinal differences and cultural political differences between the more southern, more worldly and richer uh, emirates like Abu Dhabi and Dubai that dominate the federation and uh, places further to the north. Sharjah is kind of a hinge and then you've got places like Ras al-Khaimah uh, where you go further north, more sparsely populated, less cosmopolitan, less wealthy and more conservative where you, you might find some uh, resistance to this. But, Basically, there, there hasn't been much complaint in the UAE. There seems to be a lot of unanimity that uh, the government basically knows what it's doing and, and there's, there isn't a lot of criticism. Now, Bahrain's a different story because and there, there is a real uh, kind of um, legacy of political pluralism in Bahrain, which was, was at one point a viable parliamentary at least evolving towards a kind of a viable parliamentarianism and, and hasn't been, but there are still these political societies, there's a very large um, Shiite uh, majority in a, in a Sunni politically dominated state. And uh, there are quite a few um, members of that uh, minority that not only feel alienated and angry, but uh, you know do not care for this. In addition, there are Islamists uh, who don't like this. There are leftists uh, who don't like this. Uh, there's much more political pluralism in Bahrain. So Bahrain took a bigger risk in a sense. The only thing is since the um, Arab Spring protests and the intervention of Saudi Arabia and whatnot, there's been a strong political crackdown in Bahrain. So the, the, there's, there isn't a lot of breathing space. I think the, the big question is how would this play in Saudi Arabia? That's the brittle country with, with a great deal of diversity. It doesn't have its own Saudi 
ver you know, it, its own bigger partner to keep things in. And that's where I think it, with, with Bahrain's risks, though they got away with it, you can start to see the Saudi calculations that, that would really not be a simple call if they ever decided whether to do this or not. The domestic political um, dangers are significant for them. And, and you won't know how serious they are until you try it. It will be a leap into the abyss and you'd probably be fine, but hey, you really don't know that. Th th thank you. Um, I know that this is starting to get a little bit outside of um, your areas of expertise, but but we did have a question. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, apologies as I look for it. and apologies if I butcher a name from uh, Dubul Tutbuth, who asks what might be the African Union's reaction on the normalization of relations between Israel and Morocco. So have you have have any of you been paying attention to the chatter in in the region be beyond um, to to hear how how that deal is being taken? You know, I haven't paid very close attention, but I haven't heard a lot of criticism of, of Morocco or Sudan. Uh, from mo most African countries are interested in strategic and economic diversification themselves. And uh, indeed, by the way, um, a lot of the players we're talking about are there in North Africa and in the Horn of Africa, including Gulf countries uh, in the Horn of Africa, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey also, and a proxy UAE, Saudi, uh, sorry, UAE, Turkish um, face off in Libya, which is a stalemate. Um, but I haven't heard a lot of criticism. Has anybody? Well, I think that, no, I haven't either. And part of the reason is also that Israel has been a player in Africa yes. for many decades now. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I think that uh, they, the African countries have kind of held back on their relations with Israel because of the Arab uh, resistance to that. And I think it's kind of, opens the gates for them for cooperation, which they've seen as, as to their advantage. But I think the big question that we need to really pay attention to is whether uh, the uh, Trump administration's decision to recognize Morocco's sovereignty in the Western Sahara will wake the sleeping dogs of that conflict. That's essentially been a frozen conflict uh, for years now. And uh, there's a danger that the Polisario, uh, the Algerians, and even perhaps the Mauritanians uh, will see that, that recognizing Moroccan sovereignty is something that they cannot accept and will start to resist it. And that will be very problematic for our ally, Morocco, which is why I think it was a mistake for uh, Jared Kushner to do this uh, deal whereby the United States broke a very important principle, not for the first time in the Trump administration, but, but nevertheless important, which is the uh, unacceptability of uh, the acquisition of territory by force as a principle in international relations. We've used that to oppose Russia's annexation of the Crimea we should have used it to oppose Israel's annexation of Golan, but Trump recognized that. And, and it should apply in the case of the Western Sahara as well. I'm all in favor of the Moroccan control of the Western Sahara, of, having, of granting autonomy to the people who live there, the Sawahwis. But um, to break that principle, uh, it not, you know, not only is it problematic from an overall uh, American approach to international affairs, but it's potentially problematic for Morocco. And on the other side, the deal was a lousy deal because yeah. all the Moroccans did was to reestablish liaison officers, which is something they'd done 25 years ago. Uh, it was not full normalization for recognition. Uh, and uh, they say that the Moroccans are holding back to see whether Biden will uh, recognize Moroccan sovereignty there. Um, but nevertheless, the deal that was done fell far short of, uh, uh, of Israeli expectations um, and was, I think, uh, 
a deal that was heavily in favor of Morocco and didn't yeah. work very well for American interests. Yeah, even if even if Biden were to recognize, were to you know maintain the recognition and solidify, it's still a bad deal. It's it's a ridiculously mm -hmm. high price to pay. Mm -hmm. No way. One, we've just got a little bit of time left, but one country in the region that hasn't come up yet is Oman. So what is the role of Oman and how has the recent change in leadership there played out? And Sanam, would you like to take that? Sure, uh, thanks. Um, well, I think that um, Oman uh, has uh, it just um, been through its first year uh, with the passing of Sultan Qaboos. Um, so Sultan Haytham is um, you know, leading Oman through a transition. Um, Oman, um, uh, like um, the other GCC states, has also had um, more overt um, relations with Israel, um, even um, going back to the 90s. And just uh, last year, Netanyahu, was it last year or the year before, um, Netanyahu visited Muscat. Um, so Oman has taken you know, a, a balanced um, role in uh, its outreach to different regional states, also engaging with Tehran um, quite seriously, and of course serving as uh, the convener and back channel uh, between the U.S. and Tehran during uh, pre-JPOA uh, discussions, 2011-2012. Um, so the Omanis have been um, quite careful and calibrated, um, uh, not quickly jumping on the bandwagon of normalization. Uh, despite having a serious a track record of engagement with the Israelis and um, actually watching the Omani space and engaging um, with friends inside the country, there was indeed more uh, public pushback to towards normalization. There were hashtags trending and um, specifically saying, say no to normalization. Doesn't mean that that would necessarily um, limit uh, the, uh, the government's outreach, but um, economic priorities, and I think, um, GCC stability um, has been much more of a priority for the Omani government. And um, I think that they're taking a bit of a longer road waiting to see how the Biden administration is going to engage with the GCC, engage on Yemen, um, and, and uh, maybe use uh, uh, their uh, new um, engagement with the Biden administration, um, where they had been quite marginalized um, under President Trump. There wasn't a heavy uh, engagement and, and not um, huge interest in Oman. They might use this as an opportunity to solidify or normalize. But primarily what's motivating the Omanis right now are economic concerns. So um, finding a sort of solution to those sort of challenges will be, uh, will continue to dominate the Omani agenda. And I think Kuwait is also important to mention because the Kuwaitis have a very different role on, um, on the issue of normalization. Um, they uh, uh, are highly committed to the Palestinian cause so they would be the last in line uh, to normalize. Um, they have a long um, history of supporting um, Palestinians, and you know they they have a, a role as regional mediators. But sort of generational change, I think, is important um, to consider when looking at um, uh, decision making in the GCC. You know, MBS has been rumored to long be supportive of normalization, but compared to his father and, and perhaps other senior. Um, figures in the Saudi government, um, there's been pushback. So how these states um, mitigate and manage um, uh, economic priorities uh, and security priorities um, over defending the interests of the Palestinians, I think is, and how they sell that to their populations ultimately, um, it is going to be uh, key. And I think in the Saudi space, um, as Hussein indicated, that's uh, gonna be a really important variable to watch. Kuwait is well, allergic to regional controversies. Well, there's a lot to be allergic to. No, <laughs> so, with that, oh, we're actually past time. So I want to say thank you to you all, uh, to, one for joining us today, but also two for the work that you do. It's um, even just this hour that we've delved into, it shows what a intensely complex region this is and so you must have the you know brains of chess masters to be, to be able to keep track of all the moving parts so so thank you for doing that um, we, we really appreciate it um, note to everyone who joined us thank you for all the great questions I'm sorry we could not get to them all our next event that is free and open to everyone is Thursday January 21st 
Thursday, January 21st, and it's on the future of the international liberal world order with Stuart Patrick, Corey Shackey, and John Eikenberry. Uh, we do encourage everyone to attend if you can. And, um, and again, we are a nonprofit organization. We have started doing these briefings and making them open to everyone since the pandemic. We would love to keep that going, but we do rely on donations for doing that. So if you have it in your hearts and pockets, we would very much appreciate um, any support that you can give. So with that, um, thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to our terrific panelists. Really appreciate your taking the time today. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.